Well, good morning and welcome, everybody. It is so good to see you here today. My name is Daniel, and we also want to welcome the folks watching online. We broadcast live every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock at woodlands.cc. Good to have you online, folks, with us as well here today. We are jumping into a brand new series today called Following Jesus. And as we see how to follow Jesus, we're looking how we can follow Jesus as we look at what Luke the, the, the doctor, the, the gospel writer Luke, had to say about the life of Jesus. So that's what we're going to be in uh, from now until, well, for a while. Let's just put it that way. Now, Luke, the writer of the gospel, gospel simply means good news. Luke uh, was uh, often referred to as Dr. Luke. He was a, a medical doctor. We know that from other scriptures uh, throughout uh, the book of Acts and references to him from the Apostle Paul, another New Testament gospel writer. Um, but when you think of Dr. Luke, you don't want to think about the guy in, or the gal in the white robe with the pocket protector, all right? That's not, that's not this Dr. Luke. No, when you think of Dr. Luke, think Dr. Jones, as in Indiana Jones, right? Dr. Luke, uh, or Indiana Luke, as you might call him, uh, I love this, uh, I love that pic this picture. Is it coming up, this picture, the, the Dr. Jones picture? No? That's really strange. I had this very, very cool picture of Indiana Jones that's supposed to pop up right there. You want to see it on my iPad? It's right here, okay? Kind of catch that, catch that, all right? It's such a cool picture. I'm so sorry you don't get to enjoy it. I'll just enjoy it for a moment. Yeah. Ah, that was nice. Thank you. Dr. Luke... Dr. Luke wrote uh, a prequel and a sequel, Luke Acts, so to say, and we find him on the hunt to uh, take down or trace down the facts about the life of Jesus. And that's what the Gospel of Luke brings us in a, in a really, really uh, special and unique way. Um, you see, uh, he addresses the Gospel of Luke to a man named Theophilus. Now, Theophilus, uh, it's, it's a, a, a Greek name, and it breaks down, it's actually a compound word, it's theos, which is God in Greek, and philos, which is love. So Theophilus' name means God lover or lover of God. And, and so he's, he, he, was, he was the honorable uh, Theophilus. He's, he's addressed as most honorable Theophilus. And that was an actual title that was given to men of, 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 of culture, men who were highly educated, powerful, wealthy, uh, that was, that was a, an, a, an actual title. So we know that about Theophilus. He was, he was a, a, most likely a wealthy man and a cultured man, well-read, very well-educated. And, and so uh, that means that Luke expects, when he gives his account, he gives his, his gospel, if you will, his biography of the life of Jesus, that's really what all the gospels are, the four gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're literally biographies about the life of Jesus written by these men who were very, very close to him in one way or another. And so Luke knew that Theophilus was going to be sharing this with his friends, his kind of his network, which would include a lot of cultured and, and educated people. Now today, most educated people, when you ask them uh, about Jesus, what do you hear? Well, the fact is, in the, in the universities and, and things like this, we hear a lot uh, from professors and such who are very, very skeptical about Jesus, very, very skeptical about the Bible. And uh, we hear questions like, well, where did you get your information? Or how do we know this information is reliable? And uh, so Luke immediately answers the question by saying, I'm going to tell you the true story of Jesus. Now today, you know, we look at this kind of in a uh, um, kind of in a vacuum. You know, we don't recognize that in the first century, there was just tons and tons of things being written about Jesus. But a lot of it was not true. A lot of it was not accurate. Okay, and so a lot of it uh, has been lost to history because it did not cut the muster, so to say. All right, but Luke, his gospel has lasted. The reason being, he sought the truth, and people recognized it as the truth. And we're going to pack that, and you're going to see that as we go on today. So there's um, uh, uh, three points that we want to highlight from our scripture from today. Luke 1, 1 through 4. Uh, you're welcome to follow along if you brought a Bible with you, if you've got a 
uh, tablet or a smartphone. We have Wi-Fi available to you. It's also going to be up here on the screens to follow along with that if you would like to. And there are actually three points that he makes. I'm going to tell you straight up, today we're going to get to two of those points, all right? Next week on Father's Day, we're actually going to, going to land on the third point, all right? So it's kind of a two-part message. Um, so, um, uh, you know, hey, it works for the TV, right? It works for Netflix. Uh, they leave you hanging. You've got to come back and get the next one. Right? So that's my hope. I hope you all come back and uh, get the rest of this uh, come next week. By the way, Father's Day is going to be great. We have a great time at, for Father's Day here at Woodland. So hope you'll uh, be sure and get that on your calendar. Be here next week. So these three points, they serve also as an excellent introduction to the Gospel of Luke. So number one, the Gospel is about Jesus. That's the first thing we see about this. The Gospel is about Jesus. Luke begins, so many others have tried their hand at putting together a story of the wonderful harvest of scripture and history that took place among us. Now, when he, what he means is that he is going to verify the historic events of Jesus, uh, the things that happened among us. So he's talking first person. He's talking as one who was alive in the first century, as one who was around all the people who were around Jesus. This is very, very personal to Luke, and that's what he's passing on to Theophilus. But Luke doesn't use the word what happened in his uh, writing. He doesn't say, uh, which is what the word you would expect him to use in reference to historic events. You would think, here's the things that happened with these historic events. Instead, he uses the word, here's what was harvested or accomplished, is what other translations say. Here's what was accomplished. What he's saying is, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all history. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all history. Everything that happened before and everything that happens after is fulfilled in Jesus. That's how important he is. That's how important we believe he is. So Jesus Christ is the proof and the fulfillment of God working in history from the beginning with it all climaxing in Jesus. Now, Dick, Dick Lucas was a British minister. And Dick Lucas, uh, some years ago, he was reading an essay that a man had written who was a skeptic about Christianity. And uh, so uh, here's what he has to say. And, and by the way, you know, I like reading things like this. I like talking to skeptics. If you're here today and you're a skeptic about Christianity, we're really glad you're here. Hey, folks. All of Jesus' followers were skeptics at one point, all right? Nobody starts out just fully on, full on believing in Jesus, okay? You, you, you travel a journey, you, be, you follow, you learn. It was by following Jesus, even skeptical as they were, okay? Um, remember Philip? Nothing good can come from Nazareth, he said. Well, Jesus was from Nazareth, okay? How about Thomas? I'm not going to believe he's alive till I see nail prints in his hands, well, he got to see nail prints in his hands. See, they were skeptics. The, 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 ones, the very ones who walked with Jesus were skeptical of Jesus. And so it's okay if you're a little skeptical of Jesus, all right, and of the scriptures. Just don't let that stop you. Don't let it be the end of the journey. Keep searching. Keep looking. And I've got some good stuff for you here today that goes for those of you watching online as well. Welcome. Glad to have you because we love to help skeptics along their journey. Um, to knowing Christ. Uh, so this, this skeptic, he wrote this. He said, I would love to believe in God. I really would, but it isn't possible. I, be I could believe in God if someone would just give me a watertight argument, a waterproof without a single, a watertight proof without a single hole, one from which there is no escaping. Then I could believe. He says, the skeptic, I would believe in God as long as God would give me an infallible, inescapable argument. Have you all ever talked to anybody like that? You know, there's people like that all around, you know. Um, and maybe that's where you are, or maybe that's where you were at one point. Maybe you understand that. Well, Pastor Lucas, I thought, had a brilliant response to this. And this is what he said uh, in, a, in a message sermon uh, in response. He said, I don't think God provided us with a watertight argument. He goes on to say, though I know some who disagree with me, what God has provided you and me is a watertight 
person. No holds in him. There's no escaping him. Jesus Christ is the watertight person against whom, in the end, there could be no argument. And I agree. 100% I agree. Billions of people have found that God has not given us an inescapable, infallible argument. But Jesus himself is an inescapable, infallible person against whom there is no argument. Are you tracking with me? Everybody still tracking? Come on, let me know you're out there. Amen. Come on. All right. Right. All right. Amen, pass the coffee, something like that, all right? All right? As, 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 as we follow Jesus through Luke, we will see on the one hand how unexpectedly open and welcoming and empowering and inclusive he was back in that first century to people who were considered outcasts, people who were outsiders. It's just amazing how incredibly open and loving and kind Jesus was to people that most of society rejected during that time. And I want to tell you, that would be a big deal today in, in our time. But that was absolutely unique. It was outrageous. It was way over the top in the first century, which was such a violent and vile and hateful culture. On the other hand, Besides seeing how inclusive and loving and, and, and beautiful he is, we're going to see on the other hand how Jesus is going to make some of the most self-centered claims, claims about himself that are, quite frankly, megalomaniacal, all right? It's a fun word to say, right? Megalomaniacal. It, you know, break it down, right? Maniac, mega, a mega maniac, all right? Um, so, so... It's an incredible contrast. Now, when I say self-centered, we usually think of that as sin. In this case, I mean, it's not a sinful act on Jesus' part. It's just, quite frankly, he sees himself as the center of all that he talks about. Think about the things Jesus said, all right? Track with me here. He claims he's going to judge the world on the last day. He claims that he's the author and the giver of life. Now, l let me make this a little more real for you, okay? Because you all especially those of you who have been in church for a while, if you've read the Bible some, you, you're kind of used to reading these things, and you tend to just skip right over them. You just read it, and it's like, okay, yeah, like it's actually normal, okay? But somebody who's never read the Bible before, they read these things, they're just like, what? So let me try this on for size, okay? Let me make it personal. I, Daniel Ray Wentworth, am the judge of the world. Huh? How you like them apples? Right? I am the author and I am the giver of life. I am the one who has the authority to forgive all sins. I am the one who is equal with the Heavenly Father, the God, the creator of all things. I am the one who sent all the prophets going back thousands and thousands of years. I'm the one who sent them to you. <laughs> Doesn't work for you, does it? Right? Because here's why some of you actually know me. <laughs> and you know my faults. You know my sins. You know, you know my many, many, many imperfections. It just doesn't work. But Jesus says these things about himself. Jesus makes claims that go beyond anything anyone has ever heard outside of a mental institution. Over the years, though, billions of people have said, this is inescapable. He must be who he said he is. He must. There is no other explanation for it. And this is what Luke is saying to Theophilus. How do you know God has been at work in history? How do you know that God is behind everything? Not through an infallible, inescapable, argument, but rather through an infallible, inescapable person against whom there is no argument. Has anybody here, have you, been waiting 
to get an absolutely airtight, waterproof argument proving that Jesus is really the Son of God from heaven? That may very well be you. Or it most certainly is somebody that you know. I mean, I most certainly have friends and have relatives who would fall into that category. If you're waiting for an infallible person, you could be waiting forever. Because, see, doesn't God have the right to send you a person rather than an argument? Right? And isn't that good news today when we just want to argue about everything? All right? Last, every time you open up your Facebook or you get on Twitter or open up your, your Instagram, right? It's just somebody arguing about something. And, gee, and, and, and what if God didn't intend to argue you to prove you into the kingdom? What if what he wanted to do was to send you a person who was unarguable? Well, if that's how he did it, then I want to encourage you not to wait. Because you could be waiting for a very long time to get that infallible, perfect, watertight argument settled. Number one, the gospel is about Jesus. Number two, the gospel is true. Luke shows us that the gospel is true. Many people claim that Jesus and the things that he did were legends. You know, and you probably heard that. Well, these are just legendary stories. You know, they're half-truths. They're partial truths. They're no truth whatsoever. Uh, but Indiana Luke, now he takes this on, head on, and he directly confronts this argument. He says about Jesus being a legend, no, 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 no. No, Jesus is neither legend nor myth. So Luke says to good old Theo, I know that you are an educated man, so let me tell you where I get my information so you can know that it's trustworthy and that it's true. First of all, he says, there are eyewitnesses, eyewitness accounts who knew Jesus personally and who saw what he did and heard what he said. Now, we know the value of that today. There have been many cases in court thrown out uh, because of the lack of an eyewitness evidence, right? Circumstantial evidence cannot serve to uh, commit someone, to convict someone. But eyewitness accounts prove to be very, very powerful even today. So he, Luke says, we've got eyewitness accounts of what I'm writing you about. Secondly, he said the eyewitnesses delivered what they said. Now, that may not make sense to you right now, but I'm going to unpack that in just a minute. Number three, I have followed all things closely, and I've written an account myself. So first of all, there are eyewitnesses. See, Jesus' ministry was very public. It was very public. People saw him all over the place, <clears throat> all throughout the area of Israel, Galilee, Jerusalem. He spent lots of time out in public. One time he, 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 he preached to a group of people, and the, the record tells us that there were over 5,000 men who were there, because back in that day they only counted men, all right? And so uh, when, when you do the quick math on that, if all those men had a wife and at least two kids, you're up to 20,000 people, all right? And, and, and back then there you know, was no such thing as uh, you know, birth control, right? And so, I mean, it was an enormous crowd that he spoke to. And he did it again with another group that he talks about. We see everywhere there, there were crowds. Jesus' ministry was very, very public. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people saw Jesus and heard him speak. So, of these thousands, remember also, some were enemies and some were friends. The key to what Dr. Luke is saying is not just uh, in what the eyewitnesses saw, but in what they delivered. So let me tell you what this means. In, first, in Luke chapter 1, verse 2, from the ESV, the English Standard Version translation, it reads this. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered to us. So Luke says that the eyewitnesses took what they saw and they delivered it to us. Now the English word delivered is really as good a word as we're going to come up with to translate uh, the Greek word that this comes from. Now I've shared this a number of times and I'll continue to share it with you all um, because as, as new people come to Woodlands and as, as you all are bringing friends who are seeking and, and learning about uh, Christianity, you know, so, some, one thing we need to know is that the, the New Testament of the Bible was written originally in Greek. And, and so this Greek language, our, our English Bibles, and for that matter, every other language a Bible is translated into, starts from the original Greek 
and then gets translated into that language. So here we have a word, paradosis. Paradosis is a Greek word. It's translated delivered in the English Standard Version. It's a good enough word in terms of the translation. But there are, there are times when our English word just does not capture all the meaning and all that is behind a word that we have in Greek. And this is one of those cases. You see, the Greek word paradosis, and it's, tech, uh, and it's, a, uh, it's a technical term for passing along eyewitness material orally down to another generation without changing it at all. Okay, so, so let, try, this, try this on if you will, okay? Back when I was uh, in high school, um, I used to go to you know, church youth group, that kind of thing, and we'd play this game called uh, Telephone, and it was just a thing to talk about how bad gossip was or how things can get you know, misunderstood. So they'd line us all up in a straight line, all the kids that were there, and tell, uh, the leader would tell the one on the end a sentence, kind of a long sentence. So you, you'd have to try to remember what it said, and you'd pass it on to the next person. <clears throat> and anybody ever play this game? Telephone? Yeah, a number of you have. You pass it all the way down along to the very end, and at the very end, the person at the end has to say out loud what was told them. And by that time, it has completely changed. You know, completely changed from whatever it started with. As a matter of fact, we had a couple guys in my youth group that changed it into something you wouldn't say in church. Okay? So, um, so, um, why are y'all looking at me like I'm the one? <laughs> Maybe. Not. Um, the, so, so that's, that's how we look at communication especially in our highly individualistic American culture, okay? But paradosis was a practice, and it was a binding practice. In, and in the last 40 years, there's actually been a lot of scholarly research done on this. And, and, and the way it worked was, <clears throat> back in the day, when you followed a certain teacher, what you did was that you would hear what the teacher said, you would see what the teacher did. And your goal uh, then was to commit to memory, commit to memory exactly what was said and exactly what was done. Okay, this is a practice that the monks of old who used to translate scripture before there was a printing press that they practiced, okay? And, uh, um, and, and, and it, was, it was a very fine practice where... It was absolutely essential that you memorized exactly what was said and that when you passed it down, you passed down exactly what was said. I mean, your honor was staked on that. Now, see, we have a hard time with that today because we're Americans, right? And we're so individualistic and we're so artistic and we want to add our creative, artistic touch onto everything. Right? We, we don't want nothing. We don't want to pass anything. We don't, so this is totally foreign to us. But that doesn't mean it's not real. That's exactly the way it was done in the first century. It was paradosis. It was delivered exactly the way it was taught and learned. Very, very important when you think about Scripture and how true Scripture is. So, this is what Luke writes down in his gospel to Theophilus. Luke, too, is practicing paradosis. He is writing it down exactly the way it's been delivered to him. But the average person says that stories in the Bible today, well, they're just legends, so we can't trust them. But Luke says that's not true. We can trust them. Actually, Luke raises three reasons why the idea that the life of Jesus in the Bible is legendary, that that idea will not hold up to good scrutiny. So you see them not only in these first four verses, but we're going to see them throughout the Gospel of Luke as we study how to follow Jesus. So here's three reasons, real quick, let me give you, uh, that, that, that will tell you and show you why Jesus cannot be a legend. He cannot be a legend. That's my premise, and let me show it to you now. Number one, the timing is too early. Okay, just, you can just write these down. I'll come back to them. The, number two, the content is too counterproductive. The content's too counterproductive. Three, the literary style is too detailed for these to be legends. So let's, let's unpack these. Number one, the timing is too early. Now, 
I love medieval stuff. I love King Arthur and things like that. They're always fun. If King Arthur lived, he lived sometime in the 5th or 6th century A.D., but the first accounts written down about King Arthur didn't come until 400 years after he would have lived, if indeed he did. Now, the problem with that is that, that, is that there are no accounts that are written down about someone's life uh, until when, when, when there are no accounts written down about someone's life until after they've lived, uh, then there are no eyewitnesses to fact check, right? That's a word we've kind of picked up on here in the last few years. We're going to fact check that, right? Well, if there's no one alive to check what was written down because it was written some 400 years after the person died, well, then, you know, we, we, we're really open to having the story be embellished, to have it revised. There could be additions to it. Uh, I mean, the thing could be totally fabricated, for all we know, which is one theory about King Arthur. Uh, that's, that's why when something is written down centuries later, it's a legend. It's a legend, all right? As for Luke's historical biography of Jesus, every historian, even, even skeptical historians who do not believe Jesus, but they study books of antiquities, including the Bible and, and Scripture and holy writings, agree that Luke was written within 25 to 40 years after the death of Jesus. Just 25 to 40 years after Jesus' death. And Jesus died when he was somewhere between the age of 30 to 33. Now that is huge, folks. That is absolutely huge because most of the eyewitnesses would still be around when Luke was writing this. You can't make up a legend that quickly after somebody dies. You just can't do it. You know, I couldn't spread some rumor here, you know, about some magnificent event that took place you know, here at Woodlands, you know, in the next 20, 25 years, because there's way too many of you who would still be alive who were here on this day who would say, I don't remember that, you know. I, 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 you know, he is getting old, you know. I just kind of, you know. You can't do it. You can't make up legends in 25 to 40 years. Too many eyewitnesses, too many people who can discredit it. And that's exactly what happened to a lot of the things that were written down about Jesus. They were discredited because eyewitnesses said, no, that's not true. But there were some things that eyewitnesses said, yes, that is absolutely true. And that's what we have saved for us in the scriptures, particularly here in Luke that we're talking about today. So the timing is too early. By the way, we did a whole series called Explore God to start off 2019. If you want to dig into some more of the, of the details of this, what we might call the apologetics of this, I, I invite you to check that out on our website, woodlands.cc. Uh, you can go look up. We have all of our old messages uh, there online uh, that you can check out. So number two, the content is too counterproductive. Something that just irritates the ever-living life out of me is when people say, the reason you can't trust the gospel accounts of Jesus' life is because they were written by Christians, people who believed in Jesus. Why does it irritate me? Because of the ignorance behind that statement. In other words, what they're saying is that the first Christians had an agenda, and their agenda was to get people to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And since they had an agenda, therefore, they could not be trusted to have written down reliably the things that happened in Jesus' life. Well, here's the problem with that logic or that illogic, as the case may be. When you say they had an agenda, and by the way, they did, we have an agenda today, all right? We want everybody to get saved and come to know Jesus, all right? I, that, I'm unapologetically, I want everyone to know Jesus because I believe there's a life everlasting. I believe there's a heaven that one day all those who believe in Jesus will go and spend eternity with him forever, all right? And I want everybody there. I want everybody there, okay? <clears throat> the early Christians wanted that because they believed Jesus' message. They saw him die, and they saw him raised again from the dead. And they wanted everybody to know, so much so that every single one of them gave their life. All of the apostles gave their life for him and died brutal deaths, except for most likely John, 
who was uh, probably boiled in oil and left on the island of Patmos to die. He probably wishes he would have died more often than once after that. Since they had an agenda, it's unreliable. So when you say that it's unreliable because someone has an agenda, that shows ignorance of the fact that almost, if you read the Bible, almost every major event in the life of Jesus was confusing. It was shocking. It was offensive. And it was at the very least surprising to those first century people who experienced it firsthand. I mean, there's a reason why the Pharisees were so mad at him. There's a reason why the Pharisees, you know, and the other religious Jewish leaders, you know, came after him. Because everything he did was just like, what? I mean, what? Especially to first century readers. See, see nobody... Folks, here's the thing you need to understand. Nobody would have made up the stuff that we read about in the Bible if they're trying to promote belief in Jesus. And let me show you what I mean. For example, think about the account of the death of Jesus. We read about this in all four Gospels. They talk about how Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they, we talk about what the things that he prayed and he said while he was dying. And, and for example, here's one thing that he said. He was praying and he said, God, can you get me off the hook? You know, God, I, 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 you know, is there any other way we can do this other than me, you know, getting beaten by a scourge and being hung on a cross and having this terrible separation from you? And, and God, is there any other way? And finally he submits and says, my will be done. But guys, can you imagine this? What if at the end of Endgame, Captain America looked at Thor and said, oh, I want to sit this one out. Right? Have you all not seen Endgame? Isn't it the most watched movie of all time now? Hey, I mean, that's not the way we want our heroes to be portrayed. We want them to be tough. We want them to be fearless. We want them to, to walk right into the teeth of the lion. Right? So you don't write about Jesus. Hey, is there, is there another way? Now, I'm not in any way degrading Jesus. Oh my gosh, I would have been a mess. Remember, this was 100% God, 100% human. That's who Jesus was. He had all the human emotions, emotions, and he had all the characteristics of God. It was a terrible thing, okay? But you don't write that down about somebody you're trying to convince people to believe in. On the cross, Jesus said, my God, you have deserted me. You have forsaken me. I mean, especially in a first century culture full of gods, man, you don't, you don't make God the bad guy, so to say. Now, Jesus wasn't making him the bad guy, but it, it, it sounds like that. It sounds like that. That's not what it means, but it sounds like... What do you, what do you mean that God, his God deserts him in this time of, of need? And, of course, we, that's a whole theological thing that we, we will unpack when we get there in, in Luke. No one in a million years who was trying to promote the movement of Christianity would write down things like this. Um, they wouldn't make these things up. They're offensive. They're confusing to first century readers. The only historically plausible reason those incidents were recorded in the Bible is because they happened. That's the only reason it was written down the way it was. Paradosis. That's how it was passed down to Luke. So that's how he wrote it down. The only historic, uh, see, so, or, or take the birth of Jesus. Here's another one. At the birth of Jesus, who were the witnesses, the first witnesses to the birth of Jesus? Well, if you, if you know the Bible story, and I understand many of you may not, so let me just tell you, it was shepherds. Now, if you know anything about shepherds, shepherds were the dregs of society, the absolute dregs of society, the lowest of the low class. I mean, these guys were probably, you know, brawling, hard drinking, you know, I mean, tough guys out in the woods, you know, or, or out in the fields with the shepherds. You know, they didn't smell very good. Showers not readily available, that kind of thing. I mean, you know, they were, the, they, they were these, these guys. Nobody put much stock in shepherds, okay? They were known to lie, to cheat. They probably gambled all the time. The shepherds were not people that you would call on to be your witness if you were being put on trial. Not the shepherds, okay? Not the shepherds. That's exactly who 
comes to the birth of Jesus. So why does he say the shepherds are there? Because the shepherds were there. That's why he says it. Or let's go take it another step. We, we see the writing of Mary, a woman who is not married, and she gives birth to a baby. She's an unwed mother. God, guys, you don't write that down when you're trying to promote Jesus as the Savior of the world. Okay? I mean, that was absolutely scandalous in the first century, especially amongst Jewish people. And yet, there it is. Mary, who was pledged to be married to Joseph, but who had not been intimate with him, was pregnant by, get this everybody, the Holy Spirit. It doesn't make sense. You don't write that down if you're trying to convince people that he's not a legend. Unless that's what happened. Why would you make it up? The answer, again, as we know, is because it happened. The content of the story of Jesus is so counterproductive to the agenda of Christians that the basic features of the life of Jesus could not possibly, could not possibly have been made up. Now, one last point, we'll wrap up with this. And that's the literary style is too detailed for these to be legends. The literary style of what we read in the Bible, in the scriptures, in the Gospel of Luke, are too detailed to be the stuff of legends. Let me explain. See, you're going to see this throughout Luke and throughout the Gospel as we go through it and study it. It's what's called narratively unnecessary detail. Narratively unnecessary detail. That's actually a phrase coined by Tim Keller, an absolutely brilliant pastor and scholar. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, I read a lot of his stuff in preparation for this. He was a key resource for me. Um, so what is this, this, un, this narrative unnecessary detail I'm talking about? Luke chapter 1, verse 11. Let's go back to, uh, or let's, let's go to Luke chapter 1, verse 11, a little later in this chapter we're looking at. We see that Zechariah, who is a priest, is in the temple making the offering in what's in the, the, the holy place there. And when he does, an angel appears to him, the angel Gabriel. And it tells us in that passage, verse 11, it says that the angel was on the right side of the altar. Now, many people have looked at this and tried, why the, why the right side of the altar? Why is that included in here? You know, what great theological significance is there to the fact that Gabriel, the angel, was talking to Zechariah and he was on the right side of the altar? Because he was on the right side of the altar. That's how the story got passed down. That's exactly the way it was told to Luke. And so that's the way Luke entered it into his gospel. The angel was on the right side of the gospel, of the altar. Why? I don't know. That's just the way it was told to me by the eyewitnesses. Verse 58 of chapter 1, when Elizabeth, who was Zechariah's wife, who was old and barren, she had not been able to have kids, but after that encounter with the angel, she got pregnant, and the Bible tells us in verse 58, Luke tells us that the neighbors and relatives of Elizabeth shared her joy. Now, we like to hear that, right? Here's a lady who was barren, unable to have children, that was especially disgraceful and shameful in the first century all right we were actually a lot more civilized about those things today you know we really are okay we really are getting better in some ways okay but back then it was just and so when she had this baby her neighbors came and they rejoiced with her now we like that it makes us feel good but here's the fact it doesn't move the story forward it does nothing to continue to tell us about who jesus is why is it there because her neighbors came and rejoiced with her. That's why. That's the detail that was passed on. You're getting the point here, right? You tracking with me? You see what I'm saying? It's all through Scripture. In chapter 2, verse 9, I mentioned the shepherds. Big, tough guys, hard-drinking guys. You know, they're the kind of guys that walked around with their chest out and, you know, they grew scraggly beards. No comments. Oh, maybe you don't know. I just grew this, started growing this a couple of weeks ago. Um, so anyway... You know, and, 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 and they, they, they didn't, you know, they, they didn't take any stuff off anybody. They're the kind of person who walked by you, you hit shoulders with them, you know, they'd throw it into you, you know, and keep walking. That kind of. And it says, they record, the shepherds were terrified by the angel appearance had. I, I think 
think I'd be terrified. You know, like, what? You know? I mean, that would be a little, a little scary, I think. You know? Why did they include that? That is not how the shepherds want themselves portrayed. But we see all this detail in Scripture all the way throughout. But see, when we read about the legends of King Arthur and the legends of Hercules, you don't see this kind of detail included in those legendary stories. And the reason why, as, as current readers, we don't notice how interesting and significant it is that you have all these details in the Gospels, the reason we don't notice that is that for the last 200 to 300 years in the literary world, in modern times, we've developed what's called realistic, novelistic fiction. Realistic, novelistic fiction. And in our fiction today, in our short stories, in our novels, there are lots and lots of details that don't necessarily move the narrative forward, but they're there to give it an air of reality. Okay, if any of you have read the Harry Potter books, you know they're filled with all kinds of detail. This is, this is a, modern, a modern change that's happened in novels in the last 200 to 300 years. Uh, that, uh, that's normal for fiction writers today, but it was not normal 2,000 years ago. Um, it's a modern innovation. So for an ancient writer to mention which side of the altar these angels stood on, that, that they were terrified, these shepherds were terrified, there's no reason for them to do that other than the fact of paradosis. The eyewitness accounts that Luke interviewed told them exactly how they had been told it themselves. And Luke wrote it down exactly the way he was told. And when he wrote it down in the Gospel of Luke, he wrote it down exactly that way. Details and all. So you see, the stories of Jesus cannot be legend. They cannot be legend. The timing's too early, the content is counterproductive, and the literary style is too detailed. Luke is going to enormous pains to basically say, O oh, Theophilus, O oh, readers, the story of Jesus that I'm about to tell you is absolutely true. It's been vetted in every way, investigated to the hilt. Don't believe the Gospels, folks, because they're exciting, even though they are. Don't believe the Gospels because they will meet your needs, even though they will. Don't believe the Gospels because they will lead you to a personal relationship with Jesus, even though it does. Believe the gospel because it's true. It's true. If the story of Jesus isn't true, then the gospels will not help you. If the story of Jesus isn't true, then the gospels will not help you. It's the truth of the gospel that makes it what it is. And if it's true, if it's true, that means there's a God. And that means Jesus is the Son of God. And that means he died on the cross to save us from our sins. He paid for our sin so that we could, we, could, we could follow the path to salvation in him and spend eternity in heaven with him. If it's true, we've got to do some deep examining of our lives. Not just what we believe, but who we believe. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the truth of the gospel. We thank you, Lord, that as we look into these scriptures, God, we are just completely overwhelmed and amazed at who Jesus is. I mean, God, he was so perfect. His answers were always so perfect. His actions were always so perfect. And, and, and God, it's the things that we don't understand, the things that we just shake our head at and think, what's that all about? Yet, as we study it and research it and learn more about it, we find out that was perfect, too. Because, Jesus, you're perfect. So right now, what I want to do is invite you. If you're here today and, you know, maybe you've been one of those skeptics and you heard things today that just really changed your heart. Or maybe you've been close to Jesus. You've been close to being a follower. Maybe, maybe you've been coming to Woodlands for a while or you've been watching online for a while. And you're at a place where, where you, you're ready to cross that line. You're ready to say yes to Jesus and to surrender him as your, to him as your Savior and Lord. I just want to say a prayer right now and invite you. 
invite you to pray to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord. So where you are, heads bowed, eyes closed, just invite you. Uh, just You can repeat these words or put any words you want, no magic in my words, just something to guide you. Just pray along with me. Just repeat after me. If today you want to make that step of salvation, if today you want to give your life to Jesus, let's pray. Just pray something along these lines. Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I ask that you will remember me. I ask that you will forgive me for all of my sins. Today I want to receive your free gift of salvation. Thank you for paying for my sins on the cross. Today I receive you as my Savior and as my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.